What the heck is going on? It's Monday. I am on. Good to have you guys with us. Hope you had a great trading session out there. Better than my day is going here with regards to the show, apparently. Um, my trading day was kind of mute. I had one losing trade in the morning on Xilinx, then I had a nice little winner on um, financials, but all in all, slight winner. Crypto, obviously not looking so good today, so uh, we'll have to wait and see what the rest of the week pans out. Now, whew. Man, I am literally sweating. It was that frantic, your whole body goes in overdrive, like, how do I fix this? We got it working. Um, well, Gregory says Bollinger Bands is a bunch of nonsense. Uh, I disagree, um, but that's okay. We can respectfully agree to disagree on things. It's nonsense if you use things incorrectly, and I wanted to, to go into today's show topic, which is this bad boy here, which is Bollinger Bands, and it deals with math, which I'm a big fan of, and most of these indicators are computational. Some derivative of, of historical prices or time or volume and then run them through some mathematical calculations and spit us out some result that unfortunately most people trade wrong. So I'm going to go through a couple questions today from listeners that came in over the weekend, two that I'll, I'll share with you guys. First one is from Scott. It says, do you use indicators to trade like MACD or RSI? If so, which? I'll start with that because it's easy. I do not use them to trade. So they're not really a... Uh, I'm basing my trade off of an indicator. Now I will tell you that back in the late 90s when I was getting started in this, I had so many indicators on my screen that I couldn't really tell you what price was. I'm not kidding, I actually had a picture saved, I don't know where I lost it, but it was awesome because at a certain point you don't really know what what's what, right? And you're focusing on all these indicators and you're forgetting what's most important, it's price. We are trading price, period. Whether it's up, down, or sideways, that's all that matters. Indicators can help you in the sense of it, it, it maybe defines the, the parameters of the playing field or, or the, the road, if you will, so you know how to stay within your lanes and stay within boundaries. So I think for that purpose, Scott, I think technical indicators can be helpful. We have to get be careful not to let it become a crutch where we think that the indicator is what makes trades. For example, there was a, a very popular red light, green light system that you guys may have seen commercials about or infomercials where it's like, Oh, if you just buy it when it, the light turns green, well, then you're going to make money. Or if you sell it when it turns red, you're going to make money. And if you ever went to the, one of the seminars, I found it fascinating because these indicators or this, this red light, green light system, which again, you might know, operated off of moving averages and volume, a combination of those two. And they had shills in the crowd that would raise their hand and ask about a specific company as the presenter would say, would anyone in here like us to uh, look up your stock to see how our software performed? Oh yeah, could you look up Apple? Of course, you know, Apple fit the perfect criteria where it was just nothing but money maker for the software. Anyway, what that did is that gives you this belief system that this simple software that has moving averages and volume is the answer, and it's not, right? That, that everything works until it doesn't. And a lot of times these black box systems, they'll work in one specific market environment, as most do, a trending environment. Right When you get a choppy environment, that red light, green light system will just be ripping through your account and you'll be losing all your money. So, no, do not use them for trading, Scott, particularly not making my decisions, but it can help me assess where to get in and where to get out. And I'll show you more uh, as we get into things like Bollinger Bands here in just a second. Now, the second question was a bit more in depth, and this is from Les, who was here with us today from Cape Canaveral up at the top. Uh, he says, do you use the percent B to indicate where price of a stock is in relation to Bollinger Bands. So how about I do this? I'll, I'll answer that question in its entirety, but I need to go back a little bit because some of you might not be familiar with A, what Bollinger Bands are, and B, how to use them, right? What, what do they tell us? How to extrapolate that data and make a meaningful decision out of it? So let me go to that real quick here before I dive deeper into Les's question. Essentially, it's this. If you guys go back to your statistics class, I know, don't start getting cold chills and freaking out because your college statistics course was a nightmare. Uh, I actually loved mine. I think it's the basis for all trades, the statistics and probability is trading in a nutshell. So what you're looking at here is the bell curve. No, no surprise, most of you probably know the basics of it, uh, but if you look at the, the bell curve here, it's really designed to take standard deviation, which is a specific measurement of data. And within one standard deviation is this dark blue spot here. It gets a little lighter would be the second standard deviation and three is way out here and four and such. So if we take two standard deviations and you can see it down at the bottom, there's negative one, I guess that's the symbol for standard deviation. 
if we take two standard deviations, which is negative two in that weird little symbol to positive two in that little symbol, it's this set right here. And it's about 65.4% of the data fits within that. So in theory, if you take a, 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 a data set, or whatever data set that might be, in this case, we've just put it onto price charts, 65% of the time, price should be within two standard deviations, within those goalposts, if you will. So remember when I talked about it, kind of defining the playing field, that's essentially what uh, John Bollinger, who created these, is attempting to do. It's basically saying, I want to see where those two standard deviations are, and that should you know, give me a, a good chance that price stays within that. Now we could go out even further. So if you notice on this price chart, well, two standard deviations, which is what you see in red here, that's what most of the Bollinger Bands are off of. It's basically uh, the standard. Now you can modify it. Uh, if you went to one standard deviation, which is, I, I can't move the lines here because unfortunately I'm, uh, let me uh, see if I can edit this stuff live on the fly for you, the beauty of technology. If I take this and move this one to here, for example, and I move it to there, okay, and we'll take that line out. Within those two goal posts that you guys see on your screen now, that's gonna be about 60, uh, oh sorry, I messed up. 68% of the data should fall within one standard deviation, 95 should fall within two. In, within two. Jesus, it's like if we're going too fast here. So you could use one standard deviation, but the point of that is you, you want something to be the outlier. And 68% falling within one standard deviation above or below the mean here, which is in the software, that zero line is your 20 period moving average. That's just to me not good enough, right? I'd rather see something that incorporates uh, a bit more data. So for example, if we go back to my original graphic, the only thing that's wrong here is this price, uh, this 65.4, that's incorrect. It's 98, or it's 95.4. So there you go. That's, that's what this should read. 95.4% um, is within two standard deviations. So in theory, you're looking at five, less than 5% of all of the data should be outside those Bollinger Bands. I'm surprised nobody corrected me on that one. Is that what it is, Boss Poopoo? Is that Sigma? Huh, thank you. So, you know, to me, if I'm making a trade, then 95% of the time, price should be within these goalposts. And I'll show you on a platform here in a second. We could extend it out even further and go to three standard deviations, which is 99.7%, but 95.4 uh, is plenty good. So let's go to the charts here, and um, oh, we can look at space today. Guys, Virgin Galactic, it was crazy how they had a successful trip this weekend, and their price went crashing down almost 17% today. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let me add in Bollinger Bands. I'll do it on a couple different platforms here so you guys can see how it all pans out. I'll add on Bollinger Bands, and TradeStation will add on those two lines. You can see in the middle is your 20 period moving average, which is what it's calculating the standard deviations from. So these black lines represent two standard deviations above it or two standard deviations below it. And you can see that rarely uh, it does pierce these Bollinger Bands to the up or down side. Now the problem with this is, if you look at this price chart, let's say, let's, let's um, I don't like when I can actually see all the data. Let's go to something else. Let's go to SPY and we'll go back a little bit and say right there. All right, so if you look at where the price chart is right now, it's outside the lower Bollinger Bands on this graphic of the SPY that I have. The problem that a lot of people make is they look at this and go, oh, it's outside the lower Bollinger Band. It has to go back up. It does not. It can be locked down for a long, 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 long time. You know, something that's oversold can become much more oversold. What was nice about this S&P moment, and I actually believe we talked about this one, is it was in an oversold situation right into an area of demand. So that, that adds to the strength or validity. You look back here going into 2020, you know, it broke above it a few times but kept on going up. So you can't use it for that perspective of saying, I want to look at for an overbought or oversold situation. It has to be deeper than that. So what I do in, in my analysis, if I am using Bollinger Bands on a chart, then typically I'm not putting anything on the chart. I really like to look here and I'll take, um, I'll take Bollinger Bands off just so you guys can see what I, what I look at and how I do it. And again, that doesn't make it right or wrong. You guys can look at any way that you want. Uh, but here's how I look at that data. Go back to it. On the right-hand side of my screen, I have a thing called Bollinger Percent B. So if we 
add on Bollinger Bands for a second. Basically, you have the boundaries have been set by the platform, right? They've drawn on Bollinger Bands and it shows me the upper, lower, upper and lower ones. And what Bollinger Percent B does, it says how far above or, or where is price right now relative to those Bollinger Bands? So if it's in the dead center, kissing that 20 period moving average, as we scroll down here, it should be at 50, right? 50 would be the dead center of it. So here is CFG. Notice CFG right now is sitting right at the dead center. So is applied materials, right? It's right at that middle line. Now, if I was to step it up a little bit and say, I wanna see everything that's sitting right at the upper Bollinger Band, right at the top, that'd be 100, right? So I'll scroll up here and you can see this should be a bunch of 99s. Here's uh, Google. It's just touching the upper Bollinger Band. So is United Health Group. So is Fastenal, who's reporting earnings tomorrow. Um, actually, it gapped up above it, but now it's come back down. So what I'm using Bollinger Percent B for is this. It's really about how far outside these upper Bollinger Bands are we? And that's what Bollinger Percent B does. It says, tell me the percentage. So if it's over 100%, like Weyerhaeuser, WY, it's currently 5% above its upper Bollinger Band or PNR is 5% above its, uh, above its upper Bollinger Band. Same thing for below it. I can click here and scroll to see if anything's below it and it would be negative. Right now, nothing is below the lower Bollinger Band. The closest one is KSU, which is Kansas City Southern. So this is just a way for me to very quickly look at the markets and say, what of my universe of stocks, <coughs> um, what of my universe of stocks is exceeding the upper Bollinger Bands or exceeding the lower Bollinger Bands to get that sense of extremism. From there, I'm going to do what? I'm going to apply what most of you, if you're on my Trading Academy graduates know, which is core strategy and say, all right, let me look for supply and demand zones. So let's look at it from a, a pretty much like layers. If you start off at the first and most important piece of the trade, it's going to be, from my perspective, what is the trend? Where are we now? So if we're in a strong uptrend, great. I'll look at the price charts. If we're in a strong uptrend, uh, I, that's what I'm looking for, right? Number two is I'll go to this watch list. And if I'm in a strong uptrend, I want to like click here and see things that are um, oversold right now. Which ones might be really weak? So for example, I'll look at Kansas Southern. I'm not interested in Kansas City Southern because it's been trending down for the past few months. That doesn't interest me. I'm looking for something that has been on a much stronger trend and maybe going to pull back into an area of demand. So I'm, I'm looking for the tr strong uptrend and I'm going to use Bollinger Bands to help identify oversold into an area of demand. So for example, Valero. I'm bullish on energy. You can see Valero actually a couple days ago, looks like on Thursday, broke out below the lower Bollinger Band. Let me, let me zoom in here because I think it might help. Okay, it broke below the lower Bollinger Band and came right down into this little pocket that goes all the way back into mid-May. Now, I wasn't watching Valero, I wasn't trading Valero, but this is the type of situation I'm looking for. Something that's been on a strong uptrend, something that I certainly feel bullish about uh, that has come back into an area of demand. Great example here with Valero. Only thing I don't like is, is the way the price chart looks. It's really been sideways for the better part of five, six months, so not the best. How about Wynn? Wynn's near its lower part of the Bollinger Band, but again, it's been making lower lows, so I don't feel as confident about that one. What about to the upside, all right? Or sorry, to something that's weak. So what if something has been trending down and is now coming back up in an area of supply? Well, that's where I'm looking for overbought on Bollinger Bands and saying something that might be breaking above it would give me a potential short opportunity. So to, let me see, to go to uh, the original question here, which was from, let's see, I got Scott's, which is MACD RSI, Les, um, he says, you use percent B to indicate where price of a stock is in relation to Bollinger Bands. Yes, I do, and that's pretty much it. It's just to real quickly, I think that their main use of these scans and filters should be scanning to help reduce the amount of time you spend flipping through dozens and dozens of ticker symbols. You should be able to use these scans or filters to just rip through thousands of symbols in a matter of minutes as opposed to taking hours to go through each one. Because granted, there's a lot of stuff I don't even to look at right now. Why would I even bother? Because it doesn't meet any of the criteria of trend, overbought, oversold, or those types of things. All right. Uh, number two on your list, Les, was do you just use this as an indicator as the strategic investor course teaches? Yes. Um, and I think it's pretty much, I think Online Trading Academy's viewpoint of all of it is indicators should never be used to make the trade. They're decision support tools. Um, you're not actually using Bollinger Bands to trade with, no. So 
you know, the, the example I've used years ago, which I always find entertaining, it's uh, something you could probably find it offensive, but let's say you you found your significant other, right? And you, you've like, you've, you've made the choice. This is the one. So what's great about that is you've made that trade. For whatever evaluation, you found your significant other, fine. By yourself, you made that decision, but sometimes it's nice to look at indicators to help confirm that decision. So maybe the first time you bring your significant other, let's say, uh, let's bring my girlfriend over to uh, you know Christmas dinner the first time, or whatever, or Thanksgiving dinner. We'll keep it non-religious. I'm bringing over for um, Thanksgiving, and you know I'm parading around the living room, introducing to all my family. And let's say you know here's my uncle Stochastics, and he's like, oh man, she's fantastic. And then the Uncle Bollinger Band, you know, and here comes Grandma RSI, and she's like, oh, everything's great. Yes, yes, yes. That supports the trade decision, which you already made based off of price. Now, what happens if all of a sudden I'm parading that trade around or parading my significant other around and Uncle Bollinger Band says, man, you're way off. I, I don't like it. Number two, go to my Uncle RSI or Grandma RSI and she's like, oh, no, no, no way, man. This is the wrong time. This doesn't look good. This trade looks bad. At a certain point, you run through enough of those things and if everything's going against you, you may not want to make that trade. But for all in your favor, that's simply supporting the way that you are. So anyway, thought that might be a little bit of a crude example for you, but that's pretty much how I'm using them. Now to go to Scott's comment, which is, do you use MACD or RSI? I don't. Um, could you do the same thing? If you know how those indicators work, like MACD and RSI, I could simply add them to a screener or a watch list, like I have Prolinger Percent B here, and do it that way, right? I could scan for that. So for example, just for Scott, um, you know, you can see here I've got Bollinger percent B. I'm also looking for hammers, shooting stars, bearish and bullish Haramis. If I wanted to, I could add in an indicator here, and I'll add in RSI since that's specifically what Scott mentioned. And I'll go to R for RSI, and we'll add on RSI. Okay, it's going to add on a few columns here. It's going to give me overbought, oversold. I don't care about that because if you know the numbers behind RSI. Over 70 is overbought and below 30 is oversold. So it shows all these extra columns which you simply just do not need. So I'll get rid of them. So now I can double click on this list and I know that according to RSI, nothing is oversold. Which we saw the same thing with Bollinger's. Is anything overbought? As a matter of fact, there are quite a few here that are overbought. So let me show you those and we'll see what we think about those. And let's see, RSI, there's my RSI column. So target is in an overbought situation with regards to RSI. So notice if I'm trying to buy right now, I, I wouldn't want to buy necessarily. Obviously it's in a beautiful trend, right? Target's in a great trend right now, it's amazing. But it's overbought on RSI because it's above 70. It's currently at 83.93 if you can't read that number. And on stochastics, or on, sorry, on Bollinger Bands, it's right along that upper band, so it's it's, overheated. If anything, I'd like to see RSI below 30 and Bollinger Bands below this lower Bollinger Band into an area of demand. That would be the ideal setup so I'm joining the trend at a discount. So to me that's that's the problem. Is a lot of people misuse those. What about Nike? Or Nike, however you want to pronounce it. Alright, so here's a good example of why you do not use them by themselves. Notice how Nike had a gap up here. I believe that was earnings a couple weeks ago. If you looked at this and said, you know, it's it's outside its upper Bollinger Band, I'm gonna short it because it's overpriced. Now, if you did that, you'd be in a big losing position right now because it really didn't come down at all. It's been going up ever since. This is why you always wait. Um, you know what, Gregory? You've been fun, but my mom is dead and I really don't need to see your shit anymore. So it's been fun, bud, later. Um, I gotta block you permanently because I'm just sick of your shit. All right, later. All right, sorry. Uh, I couldn't take that guy anymore. It's been getting annoying. <clears throat> um, all right, so let's see. Bollinger, Bollinger's probably have a, um, let's see, where was that? Uh, da, 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 I'm trying to read the messages here. Just a thought, but when uh, prices above the Bollinger Band, is this in any way related to an ATR stretch? Yes, absolutely. It, it, that's what it is, right? When you have, that, that really big expansion of price, you notice what happens with Bollinger here. It, it really expanded quickly, and you get these, uh, normally you get contractions, like they call it pinching of Bollinger's, and then all of a sudden it balloons out like this. So, you know, that's 
that's normal. So if you look at what ATR did, ATR surged. I mean, it had a huge spike in it because the gap. The gap really is going to skew ATR on this one. So let's go to average to range. And notice what happened to ATR. On ATR, we went from an average, it's kind of hidden on my screen, from about 220. Right now, we're at 393. You've almost 100% doubled ATR on it because of that gap. So yes, it is an ATR stretch, um, but that's normal when you have you know big moves like this. Let's get average range out of there. What other questions do we have? Um, Bollinger Bands probably have a big self-fulfilling prophecy effect since everybody, yes, exactly. And honestly, if you look through the list that TradeStation has, and I'll, and I'll go through other platforms, unfortunately, I, am, I see someone asking, Jimmy says, could you show me a click? Uh, I don't have click open right now, so if I, maybe if I can, I'll bring up Bollinger's, but you can just add, add these in anywhere you want. I don't think click has Bollinger percent B on it in the, in the watch list screener, not yet. It's getting there. Ha, oh, happy to help, Lisa. <clears throat> yeah, anytime you have an expansion, a really quick rapid expansion on price, ATRs are going to spike and your Bollinger Bands are going to all of a sudden really start to stretch. That's It's just normal. When ATR is very compact, right, not moving much, what's going to happen to Bollinger Bands? What are they going to look like? They're going to pinch and get really, really tiny. A lot of people call that the calm before the storm. When you see Bollinger Bands get very tight, the belief is that coming soon, you're going to have a break out of that. And I, and I agree. I agree. I think that the reason, or sorry, let me take that back. One of the things that I'm looking at quite frequently is the pinching of price and con con a condensing of price action. When things are normally rather wild and all of a sudden they start to shrink down and get co more compressed, 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 I look at it as uh, the same analogy as this. Imagine you take your pen, you take it apart. I think I actually can do this. And you grab this little spring. I know it's hard to see. But if I squeeze this more and more, I don't want to do it, it's going to shoot and go somewhere. If you squeeze it hard enough, eventually, well, there goes that pen. Eventually that spring's gonna go launching somewhere. And that's exactly what happens with price. When things get very compact, they'll all of a sudden, boom, and start to rip. So it, it's just, you don't know when, but eventually it's gonna happen, um, especially if it's a popular stock. Okay. Can price compression just leads to big expansion. Now I just lost a pen. Uh, never make a trade off an indicator. Correct, Adam. I mean, you can. You can, but I just I just think that you're you're almost gambling, you're guessing there with regards to what it's going to do if you make your trade off the indicator by itself. So in order of importance, it's number one, what is price doing? Right? Where's price at? What do the levels look like? Number two, what's the trend? So if you got a real strong uptrend or strong downtrend, that's better. If you're a strong sideways trend, do Bollinger bands and stochastics and RSI, do they help you? No. When things are strong sideways, you're like, okay, let's start doing some spread trades with options. I'll make money for it going sideways. If you're trading futures and it just goes sideways, you, you make nothing. So you gotta you gotta know the right tool. NJ, thank you so much, man. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for that contribution. Uh, what else? I know I missed a couple of other uh, comments here. Bollinger Band probably. Um, Lessa, do you use bullish and bearish engulfing patterns? Um, not really. I, I mean, I still think there's validity to a bullish and bearish engulfing pattern. The only problem is because it's engulfing, it's already moved so much. It's already left a lot, you know, a lot of that money is left on the table and you're a little bit late, you're chasing something. I prefer Haramis over engulfing patterns, but that's just a personal preference. You know, I, I have friends that love engulfing patterns and that's huge for them. Great, uh, but it's not one that's at the top of my list of things to look at. All right, what else do I got? Um, Tom says, I use Bollinger Bands to alert me to a dip or an um, option, yeah. You can, same thing, right? You're still looking for something exceptionally high or exceptionally low, and that'll help you understand that. Eric, you could call it coiling. I mean, I call it price compression, where it just goes, yeah, there goes that pen. <laughs> um, yes, you could call it coiling. I mean, you could put any different name you want on it, but uh, it's funny, I, I say this all the time when people are looking at technical indicators, like you shouldn't really worry about the, the, the name of an indicator or the name of a pattern. It's what is that pattern telling me? So if, if you call it coiling, where something's really just kind of getting pinched down and compressing, call it pinching, compressing, uh, contracting, whatever you want to call it, it's why is that happening and what's the significance for me as a trader going forward? That's the most important part, no problem. Also, indicators are much stronger on higher time frames, as Bob Dunn would say. Yes. Um, yes, I, I agree with that. It's especially, when, I mean, if you look at, stochastics on a daily chart versus a five minute intraday chart, you're gonna get 
a lot of false alerts on an, the five minute intraday. It's just the nature of shorter term time frames. You don't generally get a five minute chart that trends all day long. But you can see on, um, on a daily time frame, even though the candles may not all be green, you can still have a very strong uptrend and the indicators will keep you in that trend. So yes, I agree. I think that uh, the higher time frames are better for the analysis portion. So if I have to go, again, I'm gonna get hate mail from Bob Dunn here. If you have the big time frame, yes, look at Bollinger's moving averages, great for long-term time frames, right? Stochastics, RSI, fine. When you break down, you, you found your trend there, and all of a sudden, let's say you drop down to the hourly time frame. Are you still gonna use those indicators? Probably not. You're now looking for zone structure. You get down to the five or the 15, now you're, you're purely looking at zones and how am I, where's my entry and exit price? It's no longer is it overbought or oversold on the indicators because you already checked that on the bigger time frame. So I, for me, the, the shorter term we get, the less reliable or the less the need for indicators because you're already making that, you've already told yourself you're gonna buy based on what you're seeing on the higher time frames. Now it's just a matter of exactly where you're buying and to me, indicators don't necessarily help that. Um, uh, I'm told that TTM squeeze is currently the best momentum indicator. That I don't know. Don't I, I don't know if I get, I'll never say something is the best other than my dog, because my dog is the best. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if anything is the best momentum indicator. Again, to me, the best momentum momentum indicator is price. Um, I know that there's a lot of people like to use moving averages, especially exponentials, but you know it's all different strokes for different folks. And again, bottom line is this. If you're using something incorrectly, it's probably gonna cost you a lot of money. If you're using something correctly and it's making you money, then it's the best, isn't it? Keep using it. Um, can you load the Boeing Japan of the Boeing chart? Sure, why not? Because you asked me, let's go to Boeing. All right, so, you know, Boeing is, for all its big swings, really isn't that exciting with regards to Bollinger Bands. I mean, you can see it's pierced here a couple times. The good news is for the most recent bounce, of course, it's only run on day number three of it. You know, we had this break below the lower Bollinger Band on the 8th of July, came right down into an area of demand. To me, it's not the best area, but it's not bad. Look at the way we, we jumped out of this zone, right? It's a nice move out of um, out of that demand zone. So I would have expected there to be a bounce. You compile that or compound that with the fact that we had gapped down into it outside the lower Bollinger Band. This is a great opportunity. Now, if we look at Bollinger Bands right now, what's it telling us? It's not telling us much, right? Because Bollinger Bands are designed to show you Number one is trend. Number two is is something outside the upper lower ranges of that Bollinger Band. So, right now we're we bounced off today. We bounced off the 20 period moving average, which is trending down over the last week and a half. So all in all, it looks to me a little I'll say a little bearish right now, just because that trend since the beginning of June has been down, and we're making lower lows, lower highs. So. Um, it was a decent buy off that demand zone, but still makes me a little little wary because I don't feel like you're in a, in a strong uptrend anymore on Boeing. Uh, let's see, I don't use indicators as much, honestly, anyway, volume. Yeah, well, Adam, if you think about those, that comment right there, those are indicators, right? So if you look at volume, that's an indicator. It's an indicator of how many transactions happen. And, I'll, and I, I say that sarcastically because I, I, I have to have volume. Uh, there's, there's some traders out there, he, he'll should not be named. Um, out of Chicago says that volume is, is not important at all, it's useless. And if you say that volume is not important at all and you're use, it's useless, then, hmm, let's see, what's a good analogy? You are about as intellectual as a sea cucumber. Try to keep that nice and clean there for you. Yeah, volume is, is important. So that's an indicator that I definitely use, but I honestly, I don't even think it's an indicator anymore. It's just part of what price is doing. Um, volume weighted average price, that's another one that just breaks down where transactions have happened on the big scale. So to me, hey, thank you so much, CG. It's water today for me, even though the show got all screwed up at the beginning, you guys probably think I was drinking. I wasn't, I'm sober as can be, I'm fired up. I got a lot of work to do and I'm having fun. So thank you so much for that, CG. Um, and then RSI. And I think that's good to have in your back pocket, Adam, having something like RSI or Stochastics or Bollinger Bands. I think it's nice to have one indicator that you're familiar with, and here's why. I think that part of the lure for me anyway with these indicators is 
it allows you to, to learn something new, to study something. And when you look at RSI, for those of you who have looked at any of these indicators, whether it's Bollinger Bands, Stochastics, anything like that, you start to in your brain go, okay, I can put it on the chart and I can see what Bollinger Bands are doing. But then you break it down a little bit further and you start to say, what is this, how is this indicator constructed? Could I, can I do something like this? All right, let's just, and this is how I've trained my brain, and I don't, if this helps you, great. If not, no worries. We can just delete it from your thoughts. I don't want to look at RSI or any other indicators on this thing. I just want to go and pick a different ticker symbol. Um, actually, anybody, give me a symbol. I don't care. Apple is not one I look at normally. I do not need, right now, does anybody need to have Bollinger Bands on this chart? Do you need Bollinger Bands, Stochastics, RSI, or anything like that in your chart to tell you what, what's going on with Apple? Apple probably it, it probably just barely broke the upper Bollinger Band here but not by much because it's been on such a strong uptrend now all of a sudden it's coming back down but my guess is this whole run up especially here in the latter end it was hugging the upper Bollinger Band if I brought up stochastics if I brought up RSI they're probably gonna tell us that Apple is overbought right because I mean the, the trend is so clear so let's let's add on Bollinger Bands and what I would do is I would, I would bring up a price chart like this, guys, and I just pick one at random that you don't know anything about. You bring it up, and then you tell yourself, what would Bollinger say? What would RSI say? But then you start to study the mechanics, the math behind these indicators, and eventually you don't need them anymore. So let's see if I was even remotely close. Watch, I'll be totally off and be the laughing stock of the show. There you go. I was exactly right. So it's been hugging the upper Bollinger Band. I said we probably just pierced it barely, and now today we just we clipped it and came back down. No shock here, that's easy. Uh, I could add on, let's say RSI. Let's go down and some other indicators. All of these can be figured out from your own imagination if you study them long enough. So let's go to RSI. RSI is at 75, overbought. Was that any surprise to anybody here? No, not at all. If you give me another symbol that I randomly, that you just type in randomly, I'll do the same thing, but I think this is very beneficial for anybody who is thinking about indicators, is learn what the indicator does, figure out the math behind it, uh, actually, like RSI's math is swanky. I'm not a, I, that one is kind of a mess. But stochastics is so easy to figure out what it's telling you. Same thing with Bollinger Band. So plan it out ahead of time, figure out what these things are telling you, and then eventually you won't need any because I personally think that this price chart here is a lot better without all that stuff on it. It just looks clean. I don't even like having watermarks, but I do that for you guys so you can see what the symbol is because it's uh, but yeah, you usually get watermarks out of there. Um, let's see, Adam. Um, one of my mentors taught me why VWAP and previous day VWAP I see is so important, and it's where most people are stuck in a trade. Yep. So once price returns there, so many yes, and, and I think it's and nothing's guaranteed, right? I didn't mean know that. It's just basically saying, is there a higher probability there's people here? Yes, because that's where a lot of the transactions happened. Um, it's a little there's a little trick there, and that is. If you're looking at pure VWAP, then you, you're going, well, this could be big institutional buying as well. So they're not necessarily stuck, right? It reflects all buyers and sellers. So, uh, but I still find it a useful tool. Um, Peter, I've missed first of the show. What other indicators do you use? Um, I don't use any of them. That was the whole point of this show was saying that your indicator should be a decision support tool. Kind of like um, if anybody here, I know we've got millennials in the crowd who don't know how to drive a stick shift. For us older generations who know how to drive a stick shift, you know, when you're when I learned how to drive that truck, I think I told you guys my, my story of how I learned to drive. It was a Toyota 4x4 pickup, no power steering, four-wheel drive in a parking lot at Sonoma State University. And my stepdad was like, okay, you know, put it in first. And once, once I got it past the you stalled it point, it was like, okay, when do you shift? And he was like, okay, you get to 3,500 RPMs, you shift. And when I first started, I had no clue, so I was doing what? I was staring at the tachometer like, okay, here's the RPMs of 3,500. He's like, shift, okay. I, I could get in any car, any car today that has a stick shift, and I'd never need to look at the tachometer because my ear knows what the engine should sound like. And to me, that's the exact same thing I'm talking about here with these indicators. I know what the engine should, should sound like on the price charts, so I don't need to have that tachometer to tell me what the RPMs are, right? I think we all we all know that. Yes, we. Well, it's not necessarily just the sound, Lisa, but you've learned, man. In, in that truck, there was actually an engine, a resonance in the cab. You could feel it in the in the clutch pedal. Like there was a feeling of the engine. You could hear it. So anyway, there we go. A horrible 
<laughs> Save the manuals. <laughs> hey, hey, Chris, good to have you with us. Uh, I'm going to do your show, Chris. I know you got a bunch of crypto questions that you mailed in. And I will uh, probably do that on Thursday show because I think tomorrow we're going to do an option show with Corey Lane. Uh, Wednesday I'm probably not going to do a show, and then Thursday we'll do uh, a little bit more, a little bit more crypto facing. Chris, Chris has asked me uh, some crypto questions, but yeah, save the manuals. You try to buy those manuals aftermarket, they get expensive. All right, uh, let's see. Believable Direction said uh, Apple hit a supply zone and is at all time high. So there is that too. Yeah. Right, but I mean, you forget supply zones or demand zones, right? If you just look at what price is doing. So um, I can see the GD said PBI. Let's go look at PBI. I have no indicators on my chart. I'll show you guys that right now. Oof. Okay, this one's going to be a little bit messy. And the reason it's going to be messy is look how crazy the swings are in Pitney Bowes. I mean, these are, these are some monster swings that are happening. So if I was to draw or just do a theater of the mind here, you know, Remember, Bollinger's is essentially 20 periods of data. So I'm like, you know, I just uh, estimating where 20 candles are. It's probably somewhere over in here. So the moving averages should kind of be cutting through this area. And then we broke out of it two days ago and now we've come back in. That's pretty the, the easiest analogy or easiest analysis I can give you is it's not extremely overbought right now. It was two days ago, but today it's back inside that Bollinger band. So let's see if we got it right. There you go. So uh, the moving average, as I said, is cutting right through the middle here, which as you can tell, because that sideways chop, it's right in the middle of it. We broke above it yesterday on super high volume and now we're back in the middle of it. So again, I didn't need to have Bollinger Bands on that screen to figure it out. You know, I've looked at, you know, it sounds cocky, but I've looked at tens of millions of charts. I'm probably getting close to hundreds of millions. I don't know, it's just a ton. Merlin, have you ever heard of uh, failure to gain or failure to lose? I have not, Adam, nope, I haven't. But if you miss the move, how do you participate in the continuation? You have to do something to support you, no? You could. Um, the challenge there, and I'm guilty of this, this is probably one of my biggest weaknesses as a trader, is when something gets going and it keeps on moving, and it, I tend to back off it because my, I don't know, my gut always tells me it's moved too much, it's gonna come back, and I'll wait for the pullback. And unfortunately, I mean, the list of trades that I've missed because I've waited for the pullback is really long. Um, you know, there's a lot of trades I just wish I would have taken, jumped on it just because, but I'm always, I want to be overly cautious. I'd rather be overly cautious than overly eager because overly eager usually ends up in losses as I, <laughs> I'm very familiar with the loss side of things. It was, it's shaped me as a trader. All right, let's see. Big up says, I used to search for indicators that would support my trade bias. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my God! So there, uh, so we had these workshops. We used to call them power trading workshops for online trading academy, you know. And of course, it's the sales process where they're introducing you to what we teach and how it goes. Da, da, da. Um, and I remember one, I was doing the workshop, and you know, I'm going over some price charts. Da, 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 and this guy raises his hand. And he's like, "Hey, could you look at? You know, we'll do. Um, I'll make up the example. PBI. Can you look at PBI? I'm not sure. I'll bring it up for you. So we bring it up, and um, I didn't ask him whether he was long or short. I just went there and said here is the price chart, here's what I think. And it was a very bearish looking trade, right? So I told him, I said, it doesn't look good. You know, you're trending down, you've got moving averages, uh, your short-term and long-term moving averages are all pointing down. Um, you're, you know, you're still uh, on the higher end of the upper Bollinger Bands. So you have plenty of room for this thing to keep on going to the south side. And he, you know, got real quiet. And I, we took breaks and he was going around to all the students in the room, the other attendees, and he was, he was asking them, well, what do you think about this stock? What do you think about this stock? And after like the sixth person, I guess the guy was probably getting sick of it. Uh, the guy he asked, he goes, oh, I think it looks great. Yeah, I'd, I'd buy it too. And he's like, see, I told you. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And it was just, it's funny. You, you will. You will find people to support your decisions. I would rather have people that don't support my decisions because maybe it makes me aware of something that I'm, I haven't been paying attention to. So indicators can help you there. All right. Um, unbelievable direction. You said we went long on Apple. All right. I mean, all you have to know on Apple is it's extremely, um, not extremely overbought, but it's it's fairly overbought, right? We've moved a ton. Um, as a mentor of mine always says, Apple isn't a stock, it's a cult. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, man. The Apple fanatics. Anybody who camps out, anybody who camps out to get a telephone, which they could get in two days, on the shelf of the store, but they have to have it that morning so they can go around their water cooler and be like, hey, look at my iPhone 37. Yeah, that's a bit of a cult. All right, no no bashing. We're gonna keep it nice here. Um, so what was the comment here? Um, 
I don't believe I went long here. Yeah, going long right now. I don't know. Um, I'd be. I honestly, I gotta say, I'm not comfortable buying going long right here. Shorting, I'd be more comfortable with. But again, I would leave it alone. You just don't know which way this thing's gonna go. Price wise, you know, it looks like it's due for a pullback. And one of the reasons you guys remember my analogy with the rubber band. Look, if this middle line here, which is our 20 period moving average, look at the current price. Over the past few month, month and a half, it's really extending itself, really extending itself. So I, I would not be a buyer here. I would be, if I, ha if I had to choose, if I was forced, I would actually be more inclined to be going short. But I, you know, as you all know, I can't trade Apple, so it's a moot point. Dang it. I really wanted to get to this other listener question. Let me, um, and because NJ is sending the contribution, you you get you get priority. T L R Y. Ooh, yeah, this is that that pinching, if you will, right? It, it, Tilray does not look good at the moment. Again, I am long term bullish on MJ, which is the entire sector, not specifically uh, Tilray. I don't know enough about it. Brendan, who's usually here with us, he's the the guy who knows all the little neat details about all the cannabis companies. Um, but if you just take Bollinger Bands off, I think it actually it messes up the picture here. So I'll take the Bollinger Bands off, and we'll just look at price of Tilray. It doesn't look good. The only saving grace is you're coming back down to this demand zone that happened in mid-May, right? So you, it's somewhere below 1350. If it gets below 1350, you got to dump this thing, right? You got to get out of it because the bigger picture, you know, you're just going to be making there's there's really uncharted territory till we close this gap at under 10 bucks. Um, yeah, now I'm not a fan of it right now. As, as a technical analysis, right? Just looking at it, it, it looks weak. It's making lower lows, lower highs for the past month. Ugh. You know, you've got this backstop that goes to mid-May, but other than that, not a big fan of it. Sorry. Uh, let's see, it took a few pullbacks on MDI. All right, we'll look at GD. Again, now this is gonna be a long show. I really wanted this to be a shorter show because I have one question from a viewer. You did what? Took a few pullbacks on MDI. You you bought into this thing today? Oh my God, GD. You really, you did, did you have the right symbol. You bought this company today, GD. <laughs> Come on, man. I really. <laughs> I mean, you're juggling chainsaws, brother. That is uh, that's crazy. I wouldn't touch this with your money. I wouldn't touch it with anybody's money. But I mean, if you're if you're doing fine in it, you had a great intraday on a five minute. Looked awesome, right? You had these little pullback ripped out every time it sold off it had a nice rally out but that's just really dangerous to me very 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 dangerous to me all right let's go i want to do one other question here before i wrap up and show you some economic announcements because this has been a, this is um oh i didn't even put it on the screen yeah we're sent this one in good if you're day trading fine but boy don't get caught holding that thing overnight oh my god well i'm gonna make a note to check out mdia tomorrow on the show because my guess is you see how volume crescendoed volume really started surging biggest spike was in that last 15 minutes that's people those are bag holders and I don't know what these guys are doing but um, normally when you see this on a huge move the, ne the next morning one of two things will happen usually number one it gaps up and then just craters number two it gaps down and sells off or number three it gap up and keeps running so that well, I mean, obviously, those are the only three things that can happen. For me, my money would be on it's going to gap up and come crashing back down. Okay. So let me read this one here for you real quick because i got to get out of here by noon or by three. Um, Wira down in Indonesia it was a great question, so I haven't gotten to it sooner. It says, do you have any suggestions on how I can pursue this career path? What is the process of becoming a professional trader? Also, are there any qualifications that are required to become a professional trader? Yes, there are qualifications that are required. However, here's my suggestion. Um, learn as much as you can about the financial markets. If you've learned anything from the guests on this show, a lot of them, especially the guys from the floors out in Chicago, knew nothing about the markets. They got lucky and knew someone that got them an in. So number one, I would say your best bet is to have an in with someone in the financial world. Number two is even if you have an in, you got to know about the markets. So I would find an area of expertise, you know, learn equity markets, learn options and, and how that relates to it. When you go in for an interview, if you finally get into the interview, they're going to be asking you questions about your knowledge of the market. So study, learn this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, you know, I think this show would certainly be one of them to help you understand the markets as a whole. But if you really want to get down into the mechanics, nitty gritty of how to trade options, futures, forex, you know, you're going to have to go to a school for that. I don't go that in depth on that type of stuff here on this show. 
Um, obviously, there's a lot of guests that come on the program that are in schools or t working for schools that teach that type of stuff. I work for Online Trading Academy, but you don't have to go there. There's other places for you to choose, do your due diligence, and uh, you know, check them out. But my guess, my 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 advice to anybody that wanted to get quote unquote professional, and, and I don't call myself a professional. I don't believe. Um, I don't know. To me, it sounds a little bit too arrogant to say that I'm a professional. It's what I do. But professional to me is somebody who's doing it for somebody else. If I do it for myself, I don't think I'm a professional. I'm just doing it for myself. So I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, if you, yeah, I do have many fans. Katu, did you, did you uh, direct Weira to the show? Um, yeah, study, learn, learn as much as you can. Ask questions here and I'll try to fill in blanks where I can. But get as much education and then find somebody that can give you an in. Um, obviously experience helps. So if you go into an interview for a, you know, a an equity market trader and you don't know how to trade stocks or what stocks are, the mechanics of the exchanges, you're, you're going to fail that interview, right? So you just have to have an in and then have a knowledge set that they'll be willing to work with. Because ultimately it doesn't matter what you bring in to them, they're usually going to retrain you in their methodology, which is very different than the way that I trade or these guys in the room trade, right? For the most part, um, you're going to have a strategy that's implemented by them and it's counter what a lot of us are doing. Uh, so that's that's the easiest thing, Weira, is just learn. Get as much experience as you can um, so that when you walk in there and they throw questions at you, whoa, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? You're going you're gonna to have answers to it all. Merlin, what is my profession? Um, I'm a professional human being. <laughs> is that what makes me a professional, GD, because I teach? I don't know. I just, I just don't like the term professional. To me, it sounds almost arrogant, but... Um, I don't know. I'm a professional uh, human being. I try, trying my best. Give uh, apart from my hatred for traders, uh, specific traders out of Chicago and uh, Conor McGregor. By the way, didn't we watch that Conor McGregor fight? <laughs> what a loser McGregor was! My goodness, his comments after the fight were just you. You got to have some sense of respect. Or uh, boy, it was, it was bad. How did I get into it? Okay, that, maybe we can learn. Does that for Weira as a, as a quick tale here? Dina, did Big Eb ask you to ask these questions so that the show goes an hour? That's what happened, isn't it? Well, I owe you some um, some minutes anyway because the audio problems at the beginning. For me, it was I sent out resumes to financial firms around the world. Uh, I was really ready to go anywhere, and I got every one of them declined except for two. Two of them said I'm overqualified, which, come on, man. If you're overqualified, then j give me a job in a different position then. Or <laughs> it's, It was ridiculous. It was a, an easy cop out to make me feel good about myself, but I got rejected by everybody I sent my resume to. It was pretty sad. I ended up going and working for a financial planning firm and then a friend of mine sent me an article about some day trading stuff. And I'll, I'll keep the story very brief, but I ended up looking around to see who was teaching day trading. And there were three schools. There was New York, there was um, Texas, and then Irvine, California was an online trading academy. So I took an online trading academy class back in June of 1998. Um, and the rest is history. You know, I I ignored a lot of stuff that I was taught, lost a lot of money at the beginning until I finally realized, hey, these guys are teaching me for a reason. Maybe I should listen to it. I'm not better than they are. Um, had a mentor kind of help me along the way. And then in 2001, I was headhunted by an Italian bank. Just a friend of a friend ended up, you know, mentioning something to this bank. And because of my skill set, and I wouldn't say I was great, I wasn't the best at what I did, but I knew a, um, a very unique subset of the markets and this company wanted that so they headhunted me I ended up working for an Italian bank and then I got a job at university because of all word of mouth and connections um, and and basically having the chops and skill sets to back it up when people would ask me about things it was funny I remember my interview for the university they actually had a guy from the local bank there and I was told that after the interview the guy from the bank was going I don't know what the hell this guy's talking about <laughs> to, about what I was saying so basically this banker had no clue because it was new technology so they signed me up right away. It's like, okay, you, you know stuff that even the bankers don't know. So it was fun. But yeah, it was all about connections and ins. And I think it's about taking an opportunity if it comes your way, embracing it and saying, all right, if I take this opportunity and it fails. So we're, a, you know, if you get a, an offer to go work for a financial firm in some other country and you can leave, maybe you have family obligations where you can't, but if you can leave and get out, take those opportunities. Um, if they fail, Oh, well, you had an experience, you can go back home and start all over and do something else. But if they succeed, it could take you to whole new levels. And I think a lot of people maybe don't take the opportunities when they should. And uh, 
you know, we don't want to live a life of regrets. I'd re I would regret doing something having failed than having not tried it at all. <clears throat> yep, unbelievable or believable. That's nature of the beast, man. Look, we're all going to have losing periods. We're all going to come close to blowing accounts, and we have to learn from those. All right, let me get on with the this content here. We start getting into some big stuff tomorrow. This is what we've got. Um, I'm excited because it's earnings season. I was playing financials because I think there's some optimism about financials. And if you saw uh, FX um, or XLF today, great move. I'll even bring up XLF so you guys can see the intraday chart on XLF. You had a gap and go. So it gapped down and all of a sudden when it broke through the highs, I jumped on it and rode it for a little bit. I uh, made a few bucks on that one, but that uh, off offset my loss from trading Xilinx today. Damn it, Xilinx got me. But your calendar for tomorrow has banks, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Those are your big two for tomorrow. And then Wednesday, it really starts to rain with regards to banks. But all these are before market open. You have Fastenal, ConAgra Brands, and PepsiCo tomorrow. So this is exciting stuff. This will really create some waves out there tomorrow. I'm hoping it creates some waves out there tomorrow. At least gets things fired up and moving. You know, today's trading, uh, we had some, some nice moves as well. Um, but hopefully we'll get even more up down I don't care just move off of these announcements now on your economic calendar there are a few things we need to pay attention to for the US uh, CPI is the big one as you can see up here at the top 530 in the morning this again will be one hour before the markets open the expectations are the consumer price index is going to drop on the main one and we strip out food and energy looks like they're expecting it to drop a lot more I don't think so I don't think you're gonna get 0.4 CPI numbers um, but we'll have to wait and see because energy prices really haven't dropped um, yeah, well, we'll see. Then going down the list, you also have some, you have the 30 year bond auction. And then for the UK, tomorrow night at 11 p.m., you start to have a, uh, a bunch of announcements. You've got the CPI for the UK as well as PPI all in the same day. Uh, for the US, you also have NFIB Small Business Index, which will be interesting because, as you saw, the Russell um, not doing the best recently has been certainly the weaker of the group. You've had, you know, a day of movement up, but for the most part, the Russell has been ugly for the past week and a half. We'll see if that uh, maybe is skewed by the NFIB small business index numbers coming out tomorrow. All right, uh, thanks. Yeah, for those of you who like the morning, Monday morning must knows, you know what, There's, there was supposed to be, but I think that uh, the person who was supposed to post it didn't post it. So I'm not sure why that one happened. I'm actually getting on the phone with that one because it was a good one. I actually like the Monday morning must knows. It was um, Monday morning must knows, I'll, I'll give you the, the, consent, the condensed version. It was, Four things, really. You've got CPI on Wednesday. You have, or sorry, Tuesday. Wednesday, you've got PPI. And then Friday, you have retail sales numbers. Those are three pretty big things, plus the, the landslide of major financials, bank stuff coming out. So cool. Yeah, I don't know why that one didn't get posted. Um, no clue. I will get on the horn here after I get off this show and uh, figure out what happened with that one. But anyway, yes, all eyes on Wells Fargo as well as Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Citigroup. I mean, these are all major, major market firms. We'll see how that goes. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. Thank you guys so much for the input. And uh, I actually, today is the first day. I think this is the, uh, it's the 127th show this year. And I think we did 130 something last year. So we've got almost 250 shows under our belt. It's the first time I have ever, ever blocked somebody or kicked somebody off the show feels good. I should do it more often. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Sorry about the audio at the beginning. No clue what happened there, but we got it fixed. Uh, needles are popping on my microphone now. Hope you enjoyed it. If you uh, are going to be around tomorrow, we're going to have Corey Lane on the program. If you're new, hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. We're talking options tomorrow with Corey Lane, so should be an exciting one. He's always good to have on the program. I'll see you guys at 2 p.m. Take care, everybody. See you tomorrow.